I was thinking about giving a wish spell to my party as loot for killing a powerful enemy. I thought it was probably a bad idea because if someone died in the fight, it almost forced their hand to use the wish on a res. In your opinion, is that a good, a bad time to give out a wish spell? When it is, when is a good time, if any? You know, single wishes that the party can't like recover or rejuvenate are fun to give out, and you can give it out at any level. I have found wish spells to be fun at early levels, and mid levels, and late levels. It's fine. Most of the time, the party will use a wish spell to restore someone who's about to die or who has just died or to recover some sort of great magical item that they just can't part with. So if you want to grant the party a single wish, there's no wrong time, really. The only question is if they use a wish to resurrect someone, you're going to have to put some limitations on that, right? You can't just like, I wish good King Arnold from 600 years ago or 6,000 years ago was alive today and well, that feels like a bad use of wish. That doesn't feel like, that feels like maybe too much power. But if it's like this person who has just died, I wish their life were rejuvenated to as it was a minute ago, that seems fine. That seems very fine. So when someone uses a wish spell to revive someone who just recently died, you might want to describe it as like a rolling back of the clock for that person where they like get back up in the same way that they fell down and their last wound heals over. And that way you might like undo the last round of actions for them and bring them back to life. Um, whereas like bringing them back to full HP, MP and memorize spells seems maybe like a bridge too far. I really like to have my magic grounded. And so if your wish is in effect unrolling time on damage to someone, that makes a lot of sense. But if it's like resurrecting the dead to full restored body, that feels a little bit more like hyper magic. If you wanted, you could roll back all the HP damage, but like I wouldn't restore spells memorized. I certainly wouldn't restore gear that was used or lost. <clears throat> Next question, Railroad Bluesy. What's up, man? DMing a long high magic 2E campaign. Any suggestions for high level magic as a DM? My players are level 14 to 15 mages. So far, I've been able to give enemies the same magic abilities to counter and even have wizards invent spells that cause problems for the players to put them on the back foot and have them need to keep up. But as the players get more tools to deal with things, it keeps seeming like high level magic breaks everything it comes into contact with. Yes, high level magic breaks everything it comes into contact with, period, end of story, full stop. Games break down at high level areas. If there's a lot of high level magic going around, it stops making sense. At a certain point, you're like, well, this person could just destroy everything, probably including the players with like this combination of spells. Um, or, you know, if you've got all of this stuff, why would you even care about these petty events? Th these don't matter to you. You could rule the world or you could destroy the world. It, everything falls apart. High level campaigns with high level magic, especially in second edition where magic is ultra powerful, is a total wild, crazy, wacky shit show. Um, the best you can do is slow down their progression of spells. Maybe they can't find any sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth level spells. Maybe they have to invent each and every sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth level spell that they come across. Um, or specifically seek it out like they hear about a wizard who has this one spell and it's that level and like oh my god this guy's finally there's finally an eighth level spell that we can get our hands on it's you know prismatic sphere or whatever eighth level spells there are um let's go get it from this person and maybe the quest is to find that spell one of the things that you can do to sort of slow down the high level magic shenanigans is put them on other planes of existence at a certain point, you sort of max out in the, the human realm. And it's like, okay, now you have to go to the fire plane. And when you get to the fire plane, now we can have an excuse for like epic fire elementals that have 30 hit die and all have like 35% magic resistance on top of excellent saving throws. And in order to go here, you now need to find these things and use these items or these spells. And so you might like limit their gear or require them to take every, you know, each person 
person needs to have protection of fire spell or maybe four protections of fire spell that they use every single day. Otherwise, you're going to burn to death on the fire plane. If, if a protection from fire spell is what would keep you alive on the fire plane. Um, so you could go and explore other areas. Maybe laws of physics are different. Maybe the player saves are worse. Maybe enemy saves are better. Maybe the players are at penalties to hit. Maybe you just buff other creatures. Bouncing around on the planes is one way to take the players out of their environment where their spells are fucking awesome like maybe on the elemental plane of fire watery fist doesn't really help you and also fireball doesn't help you watery fist doesn't help you because everything on the fire plane just like evaporates the water too quickly and it, it's, there's not enough of it to form into anything useful When designing a mechanic or game rule or magic item, how do you determine what is overpowered and when you can add negative effects to balance it out? How do you go about balancing in general? The easiest way is to compare it to other things of the same level. So if you want to create a, an AOE spell that does D6 damage per spell level in second edition, you're essentially creating a fireball clone. If the AOE is larger than Fireball, or the spell is easier to cast, or the AOE is smaller, or the damage is higher, now we're talking about making a more specific version, right? If you say, I want to make a Fireball, but it's got a tinier AOE, and I want to set it at third level, that seems fine. That's like a mini Fireball. And, and there's bonuses to a mini Fireball. If the AOE of that is only five foot diameter, so a 10 foot sphere, you can use a mini fireball in the middle of a town street without setting the town on fire. That makes it very useful. That makes that mini fireball particularly good in certain situations. It makes it good in dungeons where you're in small rooms. That mini fireball might actually be a lot better than the major fireball. The major fireball has a huge AOE, which is great when you want to take down a whole ton of enemies, but it's also a bit of a drawback if you ever want to use it in a civilized space or a confined space. The mini fireball, it's pretty good. So I would say, especially if you're playing second edition, um, that you could allow that at the same level. Smaller AOE, same damage, same casting range, that seems fine. And then your character has to learn, you know, if they want to learn both, now they have to spend two of their, in theory, limited slots on spells to get both versions of this fireball, which now limits their other abilities. That seems fine. But if someone says, I want to make a mini fireball, it's a five foot AOE, and it does D3 points of damage per caster level, and I want to set it at second level, that would be way too broken. Second level doesn't have a lot of AoE spells. It already has a fireball spell called Ball of Fire, or Sphere of Fire, Fire Sphere, Sphere of Flame, something like that, which is not a burst, but a thing that you cast does D4 damage or 2D4 if you bump it into someone and then you roll around manually. And so we can see that a small AOE burst type spell is pretty powerful and it's way too powerful for a second level spell. Whenever we create a new spell or a new magic item, the first part of it is like, what is the effect that we want to create? And then the second part of it is how would I abuse this spell in a way to make it unbelievably overpowered? And then figure out what that unbelievably overpowered version is closest to. What other things it could be like. And then find a way to then, then set it at that level, essentially. This happens in a lot of games. You'll see it in D&D too, where there's a new book coming out and they want to add new spells and they want the new spells to be fun and on par with the old spells. And so they will say like, well, this spell is more powerful, but it has a more niche use. This spell is greater in this way, but it's more narrow in that way. And that is an acceptable way to limit spells, but you have to be careful because it's really easy to make a spell that is more powerful, but it's more limited. But like that limiting factor is not actually that big of a deal. I want to say Toll the Dead 
is that way. Range 60 feet, succeed on a save or take D8 damage. If they're missing any of their HP, they take more damage as opposed to Firebolt, which is an attack instead of a save and does D10. So Toll the Dead does D8 or D12 and it's got a shorter range, but Firebolt has a bigger range and does D8. Toll the Dead is a better spell, hands down. Um, the difference between 60 feet and 120 feet in second and fifth edition doesn't really matter. Most of your fighting is going to take place within the 60 foot range, or you can easily move into it. And Toll the Dead is the sort of thing where you can just target people who are already wounded. And so you'll be getting that D12 damage all the time. The difference between a saving throw and an attack roll is pretty minimal in fifth edition. It's just like there's some differences, but at the end of the day, they're about equivalent. Um, saving throws might even be better. And so Toll the Dead is an example of a bad cantrip or a bad extension spell because it is just better. It's just hands down better than everything else. Granted, you could look at a lot of second, uh, fifth edition spells and say that Firebolt is better than a lot of these other things, but you get the power creep of adding something because you want a cooler, uh, a specific effect, but then that effect becomes too great. So we need ways to mitigate this stuff. When we're balancing things, we compare to other equivalents. When you're making a magic item, you want to compare to other pre-published magic items and see if there's anything weird. Like things that give you speed are usually boots or maybe a cloak. So if you give speed bonuses on a sword, that's a little bit odd. That might be strong for some reason that I can't put my finger on right now. Wands give you an ability to cast spells. Staves give you an ability to cast spells, but it's usually a little bit different. Rods give you an ability to do some spell-like stuff, but it's not quite the same. But having a sword that casts a spell is pretty powerful because wands are usually limited to wizards. And so a fighter who can pick up a sword and cast fireball is now gaining powers outside of their class. You'll now have your sword in your hand all the time. So you have fireball at ready all the time instead of having to pull out your wand, which might be difficult for one reason or another, or might expose your wand for one reason or another that you might not want to do. The second edition spells and magic table, or not table, book, gives you some concepts of how to create magic items. I would read the magic item creation section of the spells and magic in second edition. Even if you're not playing second edition, the rules that they give out there will kind of illustrate some concepts that you might want to have. 